welcome everyone back to the Dark Forest. I'll just go ahead and say it. Mondays suck. Oh yes. Well, hopefully I could make your Monday night just a little bit better. Scoot your lawn chair up to that fire, toast up those voluptuous buns of yours, and let's get spooky. I was in the grocery store. Mom was by the counter paying for stuff. That's when it happened. My vision became all fuzzy and blurry. It was as if my eyes were turning into a different channel. When the fuzzies slowly cleared way, I saw it. It was in that place. Can you describe this place to me, Michael? Yeah. It's almost like our world, but it's dark there. It's always night. And the wind. It feels like cold claws on my skin. There's this snow that falls from the clouds, except I think it's too gray to be snow. It looks more like ash. And the moon, too. It's red like blood. I felt the hairs on my arms raise as he described it. I tried to keep my face emotionless to hide my fear as he continued questioning. Were there any signs of life, buildings, animals, people maybe? There were buildings. They looked just like the ones in our world, but they're all run down and destroyed. It looked like nothing could have lived in that wreckage. At least I thought there was nothing. What do you mean? Did you see something? I hurriedly said. I realized my voice sounded too eager. I needed to cool it. Uh, yeah... It was in a tall skyscraper building a few blocks from the mall. The building was in ruins. It even leaned to one side like it was close to toppling. Through the cracks of the window, I could see the shape of some kind of, like, animal moving past the window of the very top floor. I thought it ran away, but then it came back to another window and it looked through a crack. At me. It kept its eyes on me, with five pairs of these red glowing eyes like rubies. Then it moved away from the window, and I could see it running so fast past each window. I don't know how, but I knew it was coming for me. That's when I ran, and ran. I don't know where I was running to, just as far away from it as I could. Where'd you end up? I stopped by Jenkinson's bridge that crossed over the river, and I hid underneath it. I closed my eyes, wishing it would all go away. Then I felt something suddenly grab me, nearly poked me, but I saw it was just a police officer. I guess my vision did go away. The officer said I was in trouble for running into the road in the middle of traffic. It didn't feel like I had more questions. I slumped back in my seat, and I tried to mull over everything he had said. I didn't notice I was clicking my pen refusely out of nervous habit until Michael's voice punctured my thoughts. Listen, Doc, I'm not making this up. It felt like I was really there. That thing is real. Every day it feels like it's coming for me. I saw Mike grip his seat rest so steadfast that his chair was trembling. Stop it, Mike, Mrs. Clark muttered through her clenching teeth. She held his arm tightly to try to stop his shaking. Can you imagine how embarrassing it looked when you ran away screaming from absolutely nothing in the store? She asked. Her icy glare at Michael vanished when she moved her eyes to kindly gaze at me as she spoke. Look, Dr. Harley, Michael thinks he's really there in this place of his. I'm worried he's struggling to separate reality from his hallucinations. They aren't hallucinations. They're real, Mom. He bit back in a sharp voice. His eyes darted to me and burned through me as he pleaded, Please help me, Doc. He really thought I could save him. The best thing I could honestly do was pretend I could. I know what will help, I said, forcing a confident smile. I rummaged into my cupboard to fetch something I had stored away, saving for this day. I placed the object onto the table. I've had people like you come in before. These are specialty design glasses that correct for eyesight problems related to yours. They'll really help? Mike asked, surveying the glasses carefully. He doubted them. 
I tried to look straight in the eyes of Michael as I spoke without wavering. Trust me, you'll never see your visions again. I hope he trusted me to wear them. Once they had left, I sank into my chair, unable to move from the guilt that bore down heavily upon me. I tried to convince myself that I did everything I could to help. Really, I tried. Over the decades, a few people in this town had come for checkups with me, reporting the exact same problem. They had the same hallucination. They saw into the exact same place and spotted the exact same creature with red eyes. Unfortunately, I failed to save all of them. They disappeared mysteriously without a trace after a few days of visiting me. Maybe they ran away, or maybe something took them. I realized their visions might have more truth to them than it seemed. At first, it felt crazy for me to consider, but too many people reported the exact same vision for it to be a coincidence. Later, I hypothesized that some people have the ability to tune into different realms or dimensions through a faulty set of eyes. Then they'd see that creature when they weren't supposed to. Once it saw them too, it would start hunting, and once it caught its victim, it would drag their body out of this realm and they'd disappear forever. Seven years ago, I found a solution. It wasn't much, but I forged and designed those glasses from precious metal alloys and crystal glass. I knew with them his visions would stop at least. He'd still die. The beast would still come for him. But at least he wouldn't die with the inevitable, terrifying sight of his killer filling his eyes. At least he wouldn't see it coming, and he'd live blissfully, oblivious to his imminent death. Nothing is what it seems on Craigslist, or so I should have known. That's on me. Bill came through the door in an ill-fitting black suit that could have fit a donkey. He was a plump man that busted at the seams, his chin still sprinkled from the donut or pastry he had for lunch. Sorry I'm late. He straightened and fixed his belt below his belly. Had an emergency. People with greasy, slicked back hair and seedy disposition are destined to be used car salesmen. Unfortunately, this one was my real estate agent. He took me on a tour through the apartment. It was a rundown place, sure, but nothing out of the ordinary. The ceiling sunk in places. Mold saturated the walls and air. It tasted like mossy growth, and things were quite damp. Though, it was certainly not deserving of the cheapest place in the city. There was something I wasn't seeing. Uh, as you could see... He hobbled around the lounge, making wide gestures. Couple things to fix up, obviously. The walls and floorboards creak. The fridge acting up a little. Couple leaks when the rain comes through. I stroked my five o'clock shadow pensively. I've been sitting on it for a while, Bill. Something just doesn't add up, you know? This place is dirt cheap. Dirt cheap. He too fiddled with his beard freeing some crumbs onto my potential new carpet. Get you some new appliances, scrub up the mold, she'll be perfect. I shook my head. Bill, cut to the chase. I stared at him intensely. What's wrong with the place? Ah, he exhaled in defeat, helpless like he was caught in a mousetrap. His palms sweat away from his greasy forehead. There was a woman, old lady, I gestured him to sit on one of the old, dusty, out-of-date stools. The Japanese would classify this place as a stigmatized property. Yes, that's what they would call it over there. He sat down. Please explain. Well, it's not uncommon in Japan for a place to be on the market for 20 years after someone dies a lonely death, or worse, in their home, you know? The public thinks it's cursed that the previous occupant wanders the halls. I don't believe in all that mumbo-jumbo. I saw only dollar signs. To be a student and rent my own place would be a luxury, while well, signing the agreement was contingent on one thing. How'd the old woman die? I asked. 
His eyes scanned the carpet for a while and he gulped, almost comically. You don't want to know, chap. I started to say something but trailed off. I thought about it for a while. Maybe he was right. Ignorance of bliss. I couldn't stay put if I knew I'd been eating on the kitchen counter where she had been stabbed, the bed she was strangled in, that I bathed myself in the bathtub she once filled with blood. I could get this place cleaned up without the gruesome details. I reached out the bill with one reluctant arm. Deal. We shook hands. He gave me a quick nod and a smirk. I smiled too. So, how about you throw in a new fridge? He threw his head back and bellowed a fat man's laugh. <laughs> Maybe for Christmas, Jeff. The first few nights at the apartment were totally usual. Nothing amiss. Most nights after, I consoled myself that I had been dreaming. Dreaming the type of dream that Dr. Ron had told me about. The ones where I couldn't move, like I was paralyzed. He called them by some fancy long names and told me to stop sleeping on my back. I tried to stop, but every time I ended up on my back, and no matter how hard I tried, she'd be there, standing at the end of my bed. Those are the evenings I would begin to pray for. The nights where I would only see the silhouette of the woman, not hear her. In the following weeks, I would be awoken by gentle clatters, like she wanted to be quiet. She didn't want me to know that she was there. I would hear footsteps along the floor in the living room, wandering the house. I heard the water running from the tap, only for a while, and only in the dead of night, like something was drinking. After a while, though, she wanted me to know that she was there, that she was hungry. It was Thursday when I knew she was living in the walls. I sat alone in my room, reading with my back against my headboard. Rain sprayed against the window beside me, obscuring the bustling cityscape beyond my apartment's eye with glassy droplets. Sucking my cigarette, I inhaled and waved the smoke away from my book. Tap, tap, tap. Something rapped against my bedchamber wall. It was coming from the living room or kitchen. I put my book down beside me and slinked into my bed. The hallway was dim and silent, save for the sound of the waves of rain thrashing against the window pan. Hello? I cried. There was no reply. Tap, tap, tap. I sluggishly pulled myself forward through the hall and into the living room. The room smelled sickly. Decaying wharfs of sour breath lingered in the air. A low glow beamed onto the old school tiles of the damp kitchen. The fridge had been left open. I was certain I had shut the door before bed. When the sound of the rain had been pulled away by the wind, my ears twitched at the sound of the tap left running. I briskly made my way over to the kitchen, the floors creaking as I went. I turned the tap and closed the door of the fridge. I stared at it for a while. A seed of doubt bloomed in my mind. Was I just forgetful? Lights? Off. I scanned the lounge and kitchen. Nothing amiss. Jeff, you are one careless son of a bitch. I smirked at my mistake. Had to get some new milk in the morning. It was probably spoiled. In the hallway, my ears pricked. Tap, tap, tap. Something was behind me. I darted down the hall. I passed the toilet and study room and threw myself into my bed. It took me a while to catch my breath. The noise came from the apartment. It was in the walls. My head pounded from the rapid heartbeat. Tap, tap, tap. I heard it distantly through my bedroom door. My pillow fit around my ear snugly. Go away. Please just go away. For a while, I was buried in my pillow, unable to sleep. The tiredness caught up to me eventually, and I fell into a deep sleep like a daydream, or a fever. Things got worse for me at that apartment. Much, much worse. One afternoon started wonderfully, though. I called Rosie, and we agreed on a date. See you at nine? I talked into my cell phone, combing my hair in my bedroom mirror. Great, great. I'll see you then. 
I hummed a happy tune on my way to the bathroom. If I were in a rom-com, there would have been a spring in my step. Maybe there was. I made my way to the kitchen. A quick snack before dinner with Rosie. No biggie. What a beautiful, beautiful, quiet afternoon. Sunlight beamed a brilliant yellow through the windows. On days like these, impatient city folks stop for their honking outside to smell the roses and let birds sing their songs. In the kitchen, I almost tripped on a crappy tiling. My heart stopped. The fridge was open. Just a crack. My jaw tightened. The birds had stopped singing. All I could hear in my apartment now was the forceful whistle of my breaths escaping me. The apple I went to grab was rotten. A contorted mouth-shaped hole had bitten away at its flesh yellowing the fruit. Inspecting the apple, I lost my appetite. Long strands of black hair were deeply ingrained in its flesh. I shuddered and let go. It rolled for a while. A single broken tooth had found its way out of the apple and onto my floor. That night, I called Rosie again. We settled on a movie instead. Make no mistake, I called Bill, my real estate agent, about the place. I think you could guess how that went. I had to take matters into my own hands. A few nights later, I decided to wait for it. I sat in the dark lounge of the apartment, finishing my final chapters of my book. Though, when you wait for these things, they seldomly come. They come at you when you least expect. Yawning, I pushed out my chair and made my way into the kitchen. Some buttered bread, a salad sandwich perhaps, my stomach rumbled. I stopped in my tracks in the middle of the kitchen. Tap. There it was again. How I felt to be afraid of my own home, a distinct sound, one long fingernail meeting plastic. Tap, tap. My hand met the cold metal fridge handle. I didn't want to open the door. I assured my stomach nothing was waiting for me, but my heart didn't get the memo. It was quiet in the apartment again. My eyes shut tight as I inhaled. The handle turned. The fridge seal peeled open with the stomach-curdling thurp. The interior light wasn't on. From standing, I could only poke around the top shelf. It was empty inside except for a few condiments and rotten vegetables. I wiped one sweaty palm on my leg and bent down to inspect the bottom shelves, rummaging in the cold void of its white shell. It was clean yet smelled rotten and sour, the trailing scent of a garbage truck. Extending my arm into the unlit fridge, I met something hairy and brittle in the darkness. It might as well have been a vile, moldy coconut. I retracted. I could not see anything, though it felt as if it was a ball of scraggly hair filled my hand like sand. It flowed through my fingers like a soaked kitchen sponge. She hadn't been living in the walls. An icy grip tightened around my forearm. I shrieked and tried to yank away. The old woman's body twisted and buckled at the joints. One leg was bending backwards over her shoulder, the other firmly planted below her jaw. <sighs> She stared up at me from inside the fridge, slowly reeling me in from my wrist to my arm like she was a flexible acrobat carefully climbing a fleshy rope. I tried not to puke. I swallowed sour spit. Cockroaches scurried from the open lips and spread across her face like wildfire. Teeth clattered as the woman grinned, squeezing one of the insects with a sickening pop in the space where a tooth had been. Maggots exhummed themselves from her fleshy skin, dropping onto my sweaty arm like Satan's rain. Frigid, gripping fingers closed in around my forearm, then my bicep, pulling, pulling, pulling. I bent my head up to help steady myself and toe backward, my chin clasped onto the cold top of the fridge. Pulling hard enough sent me flying back, crawling onto the floor free from her decaying hands. The woman's face stared at me through the scraggly silver and graphite strands of hair, two gleaming white sockets over a wide, disgusting smile. I kicked the door shut and laid on the floor, my chest heaving. My mouth tasted like bitter acid and my hands finally let go of the unkept wire I had pulled from her head. Many nights have passed since that encounter. Bill still rents me the apartment. 
When I hang out with Rosie, we always go back to her place. Never mind. I keep grandmother fed so she doesn't wander the halls. I don't sleep much anymore, but it's okay, because I have the cheapest apartment in the city. When I'm home, I hear her when she's hungry. Tap, tap, tap. <laughs> Well, I hope that everybody enjoyed the two freaky tales tonight. Make sure you like, comment, and subscribe. Share me with your friends, and again, like always, spread me like butter. Uh.